We appreciate your presence here this evening. Uh, we're just continuing with our study in Romans, the 11th chapter. I'm giving, of course, this in uh, two parts. And uh, Lord willing, I'll give the second part here this evening. So here in the 11th chapter, what we're finding out that God, or, or through Paul, is describing how the gospel is spread uh, in the early church in order for both the Jews and the Gentiles to be brought into the church and find salvation through Christ Jesus and live in unity within the body of Christ. And of course, that was God's plan from the beginning when he made a promise to Abraham that it would be through him and his seed that all nations uh, would be blessed. And of course, that is what we're seeing accomplished here in these lessons that we been giving in the book of Romans that God's plan to mankind has been completed. Well, when we start the latter part of this chapter, we covered these two verses in our last setting, but I wanted to put the 16th verse up here because it gets into the balance of the chapter, the start of the balance of the, the second part of this uh, 11th chapter here. And in the 16th verse is what leads into it. It says, for if the first fruit is holy, as we explained last week, the first fruits of the gospel were the Jews. And it says, if it is holy, the lump is holy. In other words, the source they came in through to obey the gospel is holy. The roots is holy. The root system is holy by which they believe. And he said, so are the branches. So that leads into this olive tree that we're going to be discussing in verses 17 through 24. Now, he starts to explain here about these branches. Now, he's talking about the Jews here to start out with. And when he, we covered that 16th verse, it was talking about the Jews there coming into the church. They were the first fruits of the gospel. They were those first branches that were... Uh, in, this, in this tree that we're talking about. He says, if some of the branches were broken off and you, referring to the Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them and with them became protectors of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Now he's going to be explaining two different kinds of olive trees here as we get in, into, the le into our lesson. And we might just go ahead and show those next couple of verses here. He said, do not boast against the branches. Now, what he's talking about, these are the ones, the Jews, that should have accepted the gospel when Christ came, but they didn't. Now, there were some that did. They make, they're making up the branches of this uh, olive tree that we're going to be discussing uh, the one that's uh, the cultivated olive tree, as we'll learn a little later, that's the one that had been groomed throughout the years and came up to Christ. Well, when Christ came, those that obeyed the gospel that were Jews, they came into the church, and they were the branches that are on this olive tree, to me, that represents uh, the church. But those that did not, come into Christ or believe on Christ. And this is national Israel, the national Israel itself, not the people of Israel are the ones that obeyed the gospel, and that's who God considered his children. But the nation of Israel as a whole did not accept Christ. And so when Christ came, there were a number that obeyed the gospel, as we refer to the last time, there was 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, and then it talked about another 5,000 later. But that was just a small majority of the entire population of what was considered Israel or the Jews at that point. So those Jews that didn't come in, but they were raised under that Old Testament system, well, they didn't accept salvation through Christ Jesus. <coughs> then they were, those branches that represented that group were broken off. And he's saying, said, don't boast. He's telling the Gentiles against those branches that were broke off. And he tells them, he said, 
you don't support the root system, in other words, I support it in Christ Jesus and his commands, and that root system supports you. He's warning them and telling, you know, and he said, you will say the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, they were grafted in to this olive tree that represented uh, the Jewish nation at that point that accepted the Christ. And to me, that rep is representing the church and these branches as being the members within that church. And he's, he's saying that you're from a wild olive tree and let me back up here because I've got the wrong slide up here. And says, if you, if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them partakers became partakers of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. So I kind of got ahead of myself there. I bet there is a, a one that's a cultivated olive tree as we'll learn later. And then there is this wild olive tree, which represented the Gentiles. And of course, today, uh, we're Gentiles ourselves. So uh, these, there's some lessons here to be learned for us as well. Well, the grafting process takes place. If you're familiar with grafting, I know back home, we have pecan trees. If you take a sapling pecan tree, that's a native pecan tree, and you graft in paper shell pecan, into that sap, a sapling pecan tree, it'll raise uh, paper shell pecans. And that was a grafting process that you could could do, and there's a way you can do it, and you can go on learning how to do it. So what Paul is picturing here, there's an olive tree, that to me, that the tame olive tree that the Jews came in through, that would represent the Jews coming into the church first, and they representing uh, and their root system goes back into the Old Testament, leading up to Christ and the gospel being preached on the day of Pentecost and accepted the gospel, went into the church. And then uh, later, uh, when the gospel was being preached to the Jews, uh, to the Gentiles rather, then they came into uh, Christ and into the church. But uh, they didn't come through this uh, tame or native or original olive tree, so they had to be grafted in. Uh, and he's using that as an illustration. And he's, he tells them, he said, you know, this wild olive tree, and you think about the wild olive tree representing the Gentiles. Well, you look at the Gentile nation at that time, and of course it's basically the same today, well, it's very wicked. And they did not have the training and the upbringing through the, the uh, that the Jews had, where they had the, the uh, prophets that taught them throughout their history, and so they knew about God, and they knew that there was the coming of Christ, those that came into the church. But these that were the wild olive trees uh, were not bearing fruit to Christ, or, or to God even. Uh, they were bearing what I refer to as evil, evil fruit. But they didn't know the gospel and been raised in the gospel, and this is considered the wild olive tree. So these branches that will accept Christ, then they were taken from what uh, their economical, not economical, but their system they were raised under, and they were grafted into uh, the a tame olive tree or the one that was cultivated that was in uh, Christ. And and he warns him, he said, you know, you can be broken off just as those original Jews were broken off because they didn't accept Christ. And you had to be, uh, you had to be transplanted or put within that particular group and what the way Paul is illustrating it. <clears throat> so, as he continues here, he said, he's telling these Gentiles, said, don't boast against those branches that were broken off. He said, if you boast, he said, remember, you do not support the roots, but the roots support you. Their, their system that they came into was 
the fact they needed to accept Christ, and Christ is supporting them through the gospel, and they can also be cut off through unbelief if they turn away from the teachings of Christ as well. So he's a warning, giving a warning to the Gentiles. And he says, you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, here there, he's saying the Gentiles could brag, brag about the fact that they were now in the church along with the Jews and they had, of course, they were, were not raised like the Jews were raised, but they were now in with them in the church. And of course, they were receiving the fatness of the roots or the, the uh, nourishment that would come through the roots that fed the branches that supported, uh, supported them. So they needed to rely on the fact that uh, Christ was their support system and they were grafted in because they believed in Christ. And, this, and then Paul says here, he said, the branches were broken in that you might be grafted in. And he says, well said, he agrees. He said, yeah, that happened. Why did it happen? It was because of unbelief. It's not unbelief. You can be cut off as well through your unbelief if you turn away from, from, the, from uh, Christ as well. And he said, you were broken off and you stand by faith. And he says, therefore, don't be hardy but fair. So when he talks about standing by faith, well, where does faith come from? Well, we go back to the previous chapter, 10, 17, the one we quote all the time. Faith comes up by hearing and hearing uh, from the uh, word of God. So uh, our faith comes through the word of God, and that's where we get our faith. Well, when you talk about the word of God, well, when Jesus came to this earth, there in John, the uh, first chapter of the Gospel of John, it talks about the Word was with God and the Word was God. And then you go down a little later there in the uh, uh, 14th verse, it talks about that the Word became flesh. That's talking about Christ. Everything that Christ told us is came from God that he presented to us today. And then before Jesus uh, left this earth, he told his disciples, that he would send a comforter, which he did. And that was the Holy Spirit that would uh, told them what God's word was for them going forward. So this is the basis for the word that we have today. And this is the basis of the word that those Gentiles was hearing the gospel uh, preached. And you go even over to uh, First Peter, Second Peter, the uh, first chapter, the 14th verse there, the 20, no, the uh, 21st verse, it talks about prophecy. It said, you know, prophecy uh, never came by the will of man, but it came by a holy man of God, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the, today we have God's Word. It's uh, developed here in the Bible for us, us today to accept. And he's telling these uh, Gentiles and more Gentiles that we came in through uh, our, uh, they came in through uh, faith in Jesus Christ because they heard the word being uh, preached uh, to them today. But as far as uh, you know, how the Holy Spirit indwells us today, I know there's different views on it. I take a little different view. I take Alan Barfay's view. <laughs> uh, pick his uh, commentary up and read it, and uh, he, you know, sets a lot of things out there. I uh, take that. I believe that the indwelling in the spirit comes about through uh, the word and putting the word in our hearts and uh, that's uh, where we get our uh, you know our belief we can in other words i think that god indwells us christ indwells us uh, the spirit indwells us all the same way it's through the knowledge that we get through his word that's made to, uh, available to us today but nevertheless, um, you know, the different views that are uh, is taken throughout the brotherhood, we respect each other's view and we don't make it a test for fellowship. So, uh, but we, you know, do have different uh, thought processes as we go uh, looking at that. Well, then continuing on, <clears throat> for if God did not spare the natural branches, now he's talking again about the Jews, 
They said, he may not spare you either. So he's giving a warning to the Gentiles. He said, you know, he didn't spare the Jews that were the natural branches when Christ came. They rejected him. They wouldn't spare. He said, he won't spare you if you turn away and don't believe in him and believe in his teachers and turn against uh, him as well. And he says, therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who fail severity, but but towards you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. So he's giving a warning there to the Gentiles. But he tells them, first of all, said, you know, God is goodness. He's given them uh, some admonition, but he gives them some comfort. He said, you know, God, is, the goodness is found in God. And he said, as long as you remain in the goodness, uh, then uh, you'll be acceptable in the sight of God. But if you turn away from God, just as God's severity turned towards the Jews, that same severity will go towards you as well. And I would think one of the biggest things that happened to the Jews is A.D. 70 when the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, God turned his wrath on the Jews at that point. He destroyed the temple. He destroyed all the records I had that would go back to Abraham, so they no longer could go back to Abraham. Uh, but there was a great slaughter of Jews that took place at that point, as though the wrath of God was going on the Jews. But he said, consider the goodness and severity of God. And he said, you know, there's warnings to us as well that, you know, if we accept him, good. If we remain in him, great. And he says, Otherwise, he said, if you're not faithful to him, you'll be cut off as well. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, now he's going back to the Jews. He's saying, they'll be grafted back in, for God is able to graft them in again. He's talking about the Jews that went away because of unbelief. God has not shut the door to them. And if we sin, we have a way of coming back as well. So he's just saying God is still open to the Jews that went away through unbelief and didn't accept Christ. They can be grafted back in to that olive tree that to me, the way Paul is putting it here, would represent the church, the cultivated olive tree. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, in other words, referring to those Jews, who were who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So what, to me, he's making known here is that the Jews, they went away because of unbelief. God has not turned salvation away from them. They can come back. And he's just making it known. Salvation is open to everybody. Those Jews that went away and Gentiles that would uh, never accepted him or would accept him, uh, they can uh, have salvation in Christ Jesus. And that's the whole pr uh, purpose of Christ coming today. So he's just explaining that the olive tree, that's the one that's by nature, uh, that's the one that's a cultivated one, then uh, they can be grafted back into that. And the way I see it, that represented, represents the church. For I do not desire, my brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That opinion just means own estimation, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles it has come in. So, you know, you got to consider that at the time Paul is writing this, to me, these things are being, are being fulfilled. It's not something that's going to be taking place someplace in the future. He's talking about what was taking place in the time Paul was here on the earth and preaching the gospel. And, he's, and this mystery is just revealing something that was not known in the past. So 
uh, what Paul is doing is just revealing God's nature or God's plan for mankind that salvation is made available uh, to them through Christ Jesus, both Jew and Gentile. But he's explained how the Jews came in and how the Gentiles came in and the end of the church, and both can be cut off if they don't are not uh, serving Christ or turn their back on Christ. Now it says blindness in part. Now, to me, what it's saying here that Israel until gave a time for the Gentiles to come in. Uh, the Gentile, the Jews had turned their backs on Christ, hadn't accepted salvation for the most part. There was a group that did, but a majority of them hadn't. And he said they were blinded to Christ Jesus. And uh, what God did, he used that blindness that the Jews had of Christ to allow the Gentiles to come in because the gospel was being preached to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles were accepting that. So he used that opportunity to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And then he said, he said, this happened in part. In other words, this blindness he's talking about happened in part until the fullness of the Gentiles coming in. To me, the fullness of the Gentiles is, just means the completeness of the gospel was being uh, had been, uh, was spread to the Gentiles and was available to the Gentiles. And of course, at the time of Paul's preaching, he traveled throughout the world. He spread the gospel throughout the world. And as far as the gospel being made known to the Gentiles, it had pretty well spread to the known world in the time of Christ. So that completeness, that's what fullness means, completeness, had been uh, completed in Paul's time and there was no need of any further blinding of the Jews or whatever. And everybody is accepted in Christ Jesus that will turn over to him. Then he says, so all Israel will be saved as it is written. So how can we say all Israel will be saved when he earlier has told us that for the most part, the Jews did not accept Christ. But you recall, as we've gone through the first part there, there is an Israel that's the nation of Israel. There's a people of God that's called his people, that is Israelites that accepted Christ, and the ones that came in when the gospel was being preached. These would represent uh, the Israel that was, to me, would represent all Israel. All those that accepted Christ, they will be saved. And I think that's what he's referring to there. And then he, he quotes from uh, Isaiah. He said, a deliverer will come unto Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away uh, their sins. So, in these particular series, we're talking about Israel's uh, salvation uh, has come to, uh, has, uh, they're, they're going to be saved, all those that are in the, in, the, in the church, and I believe that's what he's referring to, these all Jews will be saved, and he prophesied, uh, he's telling about this prophecy of Isaiah, has now been fulfilled. Gospel has been made known to the Jews, and all those that has turned to them, uh, will be saved uh, from their sins, just as the promise was made to Abraham that through his seed all nations would be blessed. And that's uh, to me what he's teaching here. And these particular scriptures, uh, I'm teaching them the easiest way that I know that makes sense to me. Uh, I know there's commentaries that take different directions with it, but uh, I mean, I could read all day long and, and still be confused on everything that all those commentaries are saying. But to me, this is what makes sense, sense to me. And I believe this is what it's teaching here. And so the gospel has been made uh, known to mankind and all those that are accepted Christ will be saved. Now he, he goes back and he summarizes a little bit here. Says concerning the gospel, 
they are enemies. Now, earlier he said all Israel is saved, so now how could he say they're enemies? Well, you go back, there's the national Jews that makes up the nation of Jews, and for the most part, they didn't accept the gospel, and they were enemies of the uh, Gentiles because they did not uh, accept the gospel, and they persecuted those that were becoming uh, Christians. But their persecuting the Christians and not accepting Christ allowed the gospel to be spread throughout the known world. That was to the Gentiles. And it says, but concerning the election, that's referring to those that uh, accepted Christ and accepted the gospel. That is the election. It says they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And that fathers, I believe, is referring back to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Those are those patriarchs that were back during that particular time, and that's who the promises were being uh, made to. But as far as the Jews in Paul's time, uh, you know, most of them uh, were enemies, uh, those that were accepting uh, the, the gospel, and that's what he's saying in the first part of that 28th verse. It says, for the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. You know, that's, a, to me, a comforting statement to know. You know, God's mind doesn't change. He's made blessings known to us and what they are. And if we accept those, uh, you know, conditions of salvation, uh, we have the blessings, the gifts that comes through Christ Jesus. We have salvation through Christ. And he said, uh, these things are irrevocable. God is not going to change it. We have a hope of heaven through Christ Jesus. It will not be t taken away from us. And all the blessings that we have in Christ, uh, God is not going to take those away. They're irrevocable. So these should be comforting to us. For as you were once <clears throat> disobedient to God, referring back to the uh, Gentiles, but yet now obtain mercy through their disobedience. So he's going back and saying the fact that the nation of Jews were disobedient uh, to Christ, they didn't accept Christ, then it opened it up to you that are Gentiles and uh, made these blessings available uh, to you. So you now obtain the mercy that would have gone to them if they would have obeyed the gospel. And, of course, it's open to all of us today. <clears throat> he says, even so, these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy showing you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. So he's just summarizing the things to me that he's been talking about throughout this chapter. I said uh, they were disobedient, and through their disobedience, it's allowed mercy to go to the Gentiles and said, uh, said you, he said, you, they also may obtain mercy. And so uh, if they turn to Christ, they also uh, can uh, obtain mercy as well. So he, he's saying that, you know, if they turn to Christ, they can also obtain the mercy as well. And he says, for God has committed them all to disobedience. He's referring to those Jews, but if they're willing to come back, and then his mercy will be on them as well. Well, uh, as we get into the latter part of these verses here, and what I'd like to do, you know, Paul pretty well summarized everything up to that point, but I'd like to go over to the Ephesians and, and read some comments there, which to me pretty well summarizes uh, what is in this 11th chapter and what Paul has been teaching. So if you want to follow along, I'm going to be reading out of Ephesians, uh, the second chapter, I'm going to pick up with the 11th verse, and I think it explains uh, very well what Paul is explaining here in this 11th chapter. He says, Therefore, remember that you 
once were Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called circumcision made in the flesh by hands. So he's saying, you know, circumcision was, of course, what the Jews practiced. That's what God wanted them to practice. It was a purpose of setting them aside as uh, people that Christ would come through, the Jews. But that circumcision uh, meant really nothing as far as their salvation was concerned. That at that time, you were without Christ. In other words, while uh, the Jews existed, it said at that time, you were without Christ. You were being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of, of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So he's given the status of the Gentiles at that time. He said, you didn't have Christ. Now the Jews were raised with the uh, preaching of the uh, different prophets that were given to them. And so they, they knew the oracles of God, but the Gentiles didn't have that benefit. He said, you were, you didn't have, have those prophets that went to you and, and talked to you. You didn't have those covenants of promise. He said, you were found hope without Christ. And he continues on. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, having been brought near by the blood of Christ. So those far off is referring to Gentiles. He said, you have been brought into Christ through his blood. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of, of uh, separation. And that's what he's talking about, how the gospel is spread in the early church, how it went to the Gentiles, how that the, both Jews and Gentiles were reconciled in Christ Jesus. Christ broke down that middle wall of petition, having abolished in his place the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinance so as to create in himself, referring to Christ, one new man from the two, both the Jews and the Gentiles, created as one man in Christ, thus making peace. So now there's peace in Christ Jesus between, of course, uh, being reconciled in Christ uh, broke down that middle ball of petition. And we didn't talk too much about it, but, uh, you know, there was a lot of animosity between the Jews and the Gentiles during Paul's uh, time. And you even think about Jesus meeting the woman at the well. What did that woman say to, to Christ when he was talking to there in John, the fourth chapter? He said, you know, you're a Jew. Why are you talking to me? Jews don't talk to Samaritans. And so you can see that enmity that was between the Jews and the Gentiles. He said, you know, in Christ, uh, here Paul's saying, that has been broken down. He says that he might reconcile both to God, both Jew and uh, Gentile, in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, that is the division between the Jew and the Gentile, or the uh, conflicts that existed. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, that'd be the Gentiles, and to those who were near. He preached gospel to both. And through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. He said, through Christ, both Jew and Gentiles, we have access to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers, and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone stone in whom the whole building being fitly uh, together grows into a holy temple to the Lord in whom, uh, it says, whom you also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. 
So this is basically what we've been discussing throughout this 11th chapter. The reconciliation, both the Jews and the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. He talked about how that was accomplished. He used the example of an olive tree. The ones that had the natural branches, being the Jews, the ones that didn't uh, come in through, uh, that were Jews, that were Gentiles, they came in a different way, but they're now reconciled in the body of Christ. And that's what we've been discussing in these verses. But that set forth, uh, you know, how that we're all in Christ. And that's the, the, the focus of this 11th chapter, how we're all in Christ. And when Paul picks up here in this 33rd verse, he's giving praise to God for the great salvation that has been brought to mankind, both Jew and Gentiles. He says, oh, the depths and the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And then he continues on. He says, who has known the mind of the Lord? We, there's no way that we can know the mind of the Lord. He's quoting from Isaiah here. Or who has become his counselor? He's quoting from Job there. We can't be God's counselor. We can't know the mind of the God. But he has demonstrated his providence and his divine will here in this 11th chapter of how he accomplished uh, the plan of bringing salvation to mankind. And he said, uh, who has first given to him and it will it shall be repaid to him. In other words, he's saying, have you done anything that you could uh, pay God that God is repaying you for? There's nothing. There's nothing that we could give to God that would repay us for the salvation that, you know, that we're receiving from him. So we can't know the mind of the Lord. We're not his counselor. Uh, we cannot merit our salvation or, or pay for our salvation in some way that he owes us for that. Uh, we can't be, can't be repaid. Then Paul continues and he sums it up. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be the glory forever. Amen. So he ends it up there summarizing where salvation has been brought to mankind. God achieved his purpose and he made it available to any and everyone that wants to accept it. So this uh, concludes my comments. I approach it a little different than maybe a lot of approaches, but I approached it from the way I saw it. So. Uh, well, let's open it up for questions. David, do you have anything? I don't have any questions. I appreciate your study and your comments. I just think it's a beautiful chapter because it's always easier to look back in hindsight and see how the intricacies of that something all works together. And I think that's what he's doing in this mm -hmm. chapter. It's just, he's just saying all of this you couldn't have even comprehended how this was going to play together, Jews or Gentiles, but look how wonderful and beautifully God orchestrated it. And I think it's a, a nice, nice way he ties up the whole thought right there before he goes into you know, the next chapter where he's like, now because of all this and how blessed you all are, are Jew or Gentile, here's what you do with it. And right. he goes forward with the next, right. next thought, the next right. chapter. So right. uh, appreciate you. Very yeah. simply uh, laid down. I thought you explained it very well. Yeah. Yes, sir. Last week and this week both. I really appreciated the introduction and then today the conclusion bringing in right. Ephesians was so appropriate. And that's a, a great way to help even put the icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. But you did a really good job. Last week there wasn't any comments or questions. You had covered it so well that there wasn't a whole lot for us to say unless we want to repeat. But I, I want to make sure that I understand this point. And okay. I'd written it down earlier this afternoon. I was writing. Okay. But um, and I think it's what you said. And if not, then I need to fine tune what I've written. But the olive tree represents the people of God, if, if I understood it correctly. And that includes the Old Testament and the New Testament people. And it, well, no, I don't think it includes the, both of them. 
and the Jew and Gentile. Well, okay. the the way I, I picture that olive tree. Uh, now I'm sure you're talking about the olive, uh, the cultivated olive right. tree. Uh, to me, the root system represents everything that came up through the Old Testament up to Christ. And then once Christ came, and the olive tree has been feeding the branches, to me, that represents the church. Okay. So and, the root is the Old Testament. And the well, well, that's where Christ came up. I mean, that's, those that were Jews, they came up through the Old Testament. And, and then Christ came, and then when Christ came, uh, those Jews that accepted on the day of Pentecost, they knew the old law, and they obeyed it. And so when when they obeyed it, then they remained on the olive tree, but then those that didn't accept Christ, then they were cut off. But uh, they, from that point on, when Christ came, uh, in that tree, the olive tree, to me, represented the church. That was the church. Those Jews came into the church. Uh, those that didn't accept Christ, they knew the old law, and they came up the same way the ones that did accept him. They should have been branches in that tree, but they they wasn't branches in that tree. They were cut off from being branches. So I don't know. That's, that, makes, that, that makes sense. Totally. I mean, that's I sort of the way I was picturing it, but... <laughs> Some I may picture it completely different, but that's that's the way I expect it. Well, great job, and I thoroughly yeah. enjoyed it, and it's really good information for gives the overall picture. Right. You did a yeah. wonderful job. Yeah. Bobby, you have anything? Yes, I appreciate it very much. It's David and Alan have said the presentation really easy to understand. I really appreciate it. I have, I think there's three things, at least to me comes out of this chapter, that even though he's talking about Jew and Gentile, it still applies to us. Number one, there is, uh, their rejection was not final. As long as they were alive, they had an opportunity to obey the gospel and do that which God or Christ had demanded at that time. So they had something to look forward to, even though uh, he explains how they came together. Number two, God judges each, both Jew and Gentile, and his mercy is extended to each. So it didn't matter if you were Jew or Gentile, you had mercy extended to you. And that's true uh, today to everybody. Long as there's time, there, he has extended his mercy to you. And then number three, uh, he is willing, willing and able to receive them once they come to him in obedience. And that's the message that we to give to people. Uh, you can come to him, come to him in obedience, he's willing to receive. Yeah, I agree. I don't disagree with anything you said. Uh, but at the time Paul was writing this, he was dealing with the situation that was there. But th the same principle applies to us today. But it, to me, in these scriptures, He's saying how the church got started and how the Jews were reconciled in Christ Jesus. And that's what Paul was going through. And he, he of course, gives a warning. But everything you said is true. I mean, it's a, definitely a warning to us today. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. Anyway, over here, Michael? Yeah, I'll add, uh, we, we've talked about through the book of Romans how there's a lot of Calvinistic landmines, as I describe it. And of course, if you just focus on one verse here and one verse there, you can, you know, people can convince other people of that. But God kind of pointing out in this chapter the concept of the olive branch. And Jesus taught in the in the gospels about the olive branch. And if there's a branch that doesn't bring forth fruit, a branch that that dies, you know, he he says it's cut off, and I've had this conversation with different denominational people who believe in once saved, always saved, and I'm like, well, if you're cut off from the olive branch, how can you still be saved? And of course, they make the argument that, well, that's a physical death, it's not a spiritual death, but you know, the next step is getting thrown into the fire, and uh, that's a little bit more, I don't know. You know, that's not quite a good argument, but 
when, when you when you do talk about when you with people who believe in Calvinism once saved always saved, then certainly you can bring up this picture of the olive branch and being cut off and what exactly that means in the Gospels and how it's not a good thing for in any any stretch of the imagination. Uh, very good point. And I uh, really appreciated uh, Gary when he gave, you know, that ninth chapter, he went in a lot of, on, uh, you know, this predestination and Calvinistic doctrine. And, and I really, it set, it set the stage for me going through all these chapters. And so, yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, okay. Did I miss somebody? Oh, I need a second. Oh, okay. It's okay, but I'm just, I guess, piggybacking off of what Dad said. I had no clue what the tree, the tree and the roots, any of that meant when I read it the first time. And your, and you and after Dad's question, talking about how the Gentiles were, you know, were grafted in, really sealed the deal on that, on that being, you know, the faithful, you know. And so, it are everything made sense. But then, when you talked about, or, you know, earlier and earlier, whatever verses those what those were about. The Gentile being grafted in and, and being a new, that was, like I said, what sealed the deal. That was, so that was good. Thank you. Well, uh, both Jews and Gentiles are both in the same olive tree. <laughs> which I, I picture has been the church, but, uh, you know, some, somebody might take a different uh, way of viewing of it. That's what made the most sense to me. But, yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments from the brother? If not, uh, we wouldn't think of closing the lesson without offering the invitation. Uh, the salvation has been offered through Christ Jesus. And uh, as we pointed out, you know, faith comes by hearing, hearing from the Word of God. So, you know, you've heard the Word. You need to believe it, repent of sins, confess the name of Christ, and be lowered into the water, uh, water grave of baptism. If you've taken these steps and for some way, some way you've uh, come up short and desire the prayers of the church or I haven't sinned and you just got some weakness you want us to pray for, uh, you know, we'd be glad to accommodate you as well. We invite you to come while we stay in the same song selected.